During the past 10 or 12 years, I've served as a subject editor for the journal Zoo Taxa for freshwater fishes. During this time, I've processed maybe 600 manuscripts for the journal, of which, sadly, about 200, about one third, have been rejected. This level of rejection is something that worries me, which is why I chose to talk about it this afternoon. For one thing, that one third of papers that were rejected represents a huge amount of work. Museum visits, field work, laboratory work, analyses, collaboration between scientists and so on. That work might have been much better spent on a more productive project which followed, which avoided at least, some of the common errors that we make when preparing taxonomic manuscripts. Sadly, in many cases, papers that are rejected end up being published in other journals which might have a lower standard of peer review than Zootaxa does, or they might be submitted to an altogether different kind of journal, a predatory journal, in which they are not subjected to peer review at all. And that's why I thought we should dwell a while on trying to learn how best to avoid making these kinds of mistakes. And to do this, I'm going to do it the hard way. I'm going to discuss primarily the mistakes that I've made in my career in taxonomy and try and use those examples to, <clears throat> to explain how I think we should avoid similar mistakes in the future. In addition to the rejection rate prior to review, if you look at catalogue of fishes, you soon see that about 40% of all available fish names are synonyms. That's 40% of taxonomic effort wasted there alone. And the actual proportion of synonyms is probably substantially higher because not all groups of fishes have been reviewed or revised in recent years. So we can assume that something between half and maybe 60% of taxonomic effort is wasted either before acceptance of a paper or by synonymization after acceptance. This is a tragic outcome and we need to do more to try to publish work that is more reliable and less likely to be overturned. If you think about it, as you've probably already heard in, in the course of these talks this week, describing a new species is in effect testing a hypothesis. The hypothesis is this is a new species. And we, having collected the material for the new species, look at integrating all the available evidence, uh, molecular evidence, morphological evidence, behavioral and ecological evidence, everything that we can find that's associated with its phenotype in order to find out whether it is the same or different than other already described species. However, we rarely stop to investigate the null hypothesis. That is to say, we don't pay attention to the possibility that this is not a new species. We don't think what else might e explain the observed variation. And this is a weakness in our approach. Having written our paper, we rarely stop to ask also, are the conclusions that we made actually valid? Uh, valid? Are they correct? And this is something that we could do ourselves, and many experienced scientists do themselves, by questioning the results they come up with. And then you might find that no, you are wrong, and you reject your own work. But the thing is, in many cases, when we collect, in the course of fieldwork, a species that appears to be new, we rush to the conclusion that it is in fact new. In fact, 
Often before we've returned to our lab, we've decided on a name and where to publish it, and with whom. That rush is something that I think every taxonomist learns through bitter experience to avoid. So here's an example of a paper I led in 2008 uh, to publish uh, a new species of Laubuca from Sri Lanka, Laubuca insularis. Its closest congener is the species you see at the bottom of your screen, Laubuca lankensis. And as you see from this immediate comparison of the two pictures, the two species, or the two nominal species, look uh, superficially quite different. And in fact, based on the samples that we had at the time, they were quite different. But there was a problem. Because the sample size we examined was just 10 examples from each species. More recently, uh, Hiranya Sudasinghe, who is my colleague and whose work I will be citing extensively in the course of this talk, examined a much larger sample of more than 60 specimens and he found that the two species were in fact the same. The mistake we had made originally was a combination of different factors. Size allometry, which you've probably heard about this week and I will refer to later in this talk. Sexual dimorphism. Seasonal variation because Fish's morphology can change with, se with seasons, for example, the appearance of tubercles. Polymorphism, the, the fact that all members of a population aren't identical. And the application of consistent methods, especially when multiple authors are involved, to make sure that everybody is using the, the same set of identical methods. These are all weaknesses that we encounter at various points in a project, and all these weaknesses combined in this one paper uh, to lead us to publish uh, a species that was later synonymized. And when Hiranya looked at the morphology, as you can see from the multivariate analysis at the top of your screen on the, on the right hand side, um, the two species overlapped almost entirely. And the molecular analysis on the left shows also uh, Labuca insularis to be nested entirely within Labuca lankensis. An error that could have been avoided if we looked at a larger sample of specimens and if we looked at a larger sample of specimens collected from multiple locations, multiple different habitats, because there is some kind of selection in a single habitat. But about, I'd say, more than three quarters of the taxonomic papers I see today involve specimens or type series that are collected from only a single location. Wider geographic sampling does lead to different conclusions and this is something that's important to emphasize. Here's an example um, from a manuscript I received that unfortunately was rejected. Um, I should emphasize that none of the pictures you're seeing today from any of, uh, from any of these manuscripts and the process of peer review in Zootaxa, as in most other journals, is secret and anonymous. So I can't refer to any specific examples or authors or uh, particular species that might identify the authors. Um, but these pictures from the internet uh, can illustrate my point. The fish on the top, I've, I've drawn a mark in its humeral region, just above the pectoral fin origin, this black oval blotch. Um, the species looks, the, the putative new species looks very much like Pethia conconius, which is what you see at the bottom. It's an aquarium specimen, that's why it's all orange. Um, but apart from that, this is conconius, um, except that it had this distinctive black oval blotch above the pectoral fin. And that difference led the authors to believe that it was a different species. Um, and of course, given the sample size that they were associated with, it was quite clear that there were some differences that justified uh, differentiating this population from Conconius. So this went out for review, 
and in the course of review, one of the reviewers was very uh, suspicious about this new species, and not in a bad way, but he was curious to find out uh, what this meant. So he went out and collected some Conconias, and having done so, he subjected them to various different conditions. Some of them were preserved in alcohol, some of them were preserved in formalin, and some of them were preserved uh, after some, some hours after death. And he found that if you kept a specimen of Conconius dead for a few hours, it developed a black blotch on the humeral region. So this is actually a preservation artifact that misled the authors into believing that this was a different species. And that illustrates another point about the value of the review process because many reviewers do a fantastic job. They pore over the manuscript, they try to find out what its weaknesses might be and help the authors improve their work. The peer review system is hugely valuable. But we waste it if we give reviewers consistently bad manuscripts because then many reviewers refuse to review manuscripts uh, in future. There are quite a few really ex expert ichthyologists who will not accept Asian or South Asian manuscripts for review now. When I write and ask them if they'll review these manuscripts, they don't reply. And I know that these are people who would normally undertake a review if they felt that they were getting good papers, but no one wants to review a really bad paper because it's, it's a lot of work that the author should be doing that the reviewer is forced to do. But in many cases, a reviewer will take a manuscript to their lab, they might dig up specimens from their collection, um, try and understand what, what the species is all about, use their experience to help improve the paper. But it's important to start with a manuscript that is worth reviewing. Here's another example in which I was misled. The fish at the bottom is a Heteropneustes, uh, which Gunther described in 1864, called Heteropneustes uh, microps. It was from Sri Lanka. He had only the one specimen. And the difference between Heteropneustes microps and Heteropneustes fossilis, the species widespread throughout South Asia, was that the anal and caudal fins are confluent in microps and not confluent in fossilis. And I was curious about this species and after a lot of effort I managed to collect a specimen in Sri Lanka, so it seemed to be very rare, not just endemic to Sri Lanka but also very rare. And I considered to be valid, it to be valid until a colleague of mine, Mohammed Bahir, pointed out to me that he had injured the tail of a juvenile uh, fossilis and when the fossilis grew up the anal and caudal fins became confluent. So I was curious and on my next visit to the Natural History Museum in London I asked to x-ray the caudal region of the holotype of Heteropneustes microps, the Gunther specimen, and on the in the middle photo at the top you see the x-ray of the uh, caudal region of the holotype and as you can see the hypural uh, fan is almost completely absent. It has been severed and it's clear from uh, the osteology of the tail region that the specimen has suffered damage when you compare it with the, the caudal region of a, a normal fossilis. So Heteropneustes microps was based on an, ab an aberrant specimen um, and we considered it a synonym. That was 20 years ago, but I still see this name popping up in the literature from time to time, uh, allegedly rediscovered in various parts of the world, because uh, various parts of Asia, because uh, authors might not be aware of the synonymy. A few years ago, some colleagues in Sri Lanka named the fish at the bottom in my honour as Rasburoides rohani. The genus Rasburoides is endemic to Sri Lanka. It's known from two species uh, confined to the southwestern quarter of the island, which is covered in rainforest. They found the population they named as Rasburoides rohani in the Singharaja World Heritage Site, a, a pristine rainforest, 
um, at a site which hadn't been well explored until then, or so they thought. And they, dis they distinguished this new species from Rasperoides pallidus uh, and Rasperoides vateriflorus, the two other species, by a suite of uh, morphological characters. But the most distinctive thing about Rohani is its size. It's substantially about 30% larger than either pallidus or vateriflorus. And they also found many other characters by which to distinguish it, as you can see here. Uh, the photos I'm showing you are slightly misleading because at the bottom is Rohani, uh, a male, and at the top is Pallidus, a female, but uh, the, the species in fact had some morphological differences that became apparent from the sample size that was investigated by the authors of the paper. More recently, Hiranya examined these populations again including with a molecular analysis and found that Rohani was in fact identical with Pallidus. As you can see there in the top branch, um, the three specimens of Rohani in red are nested clearly within the Pallidus clade. This mistake happened to be made quite innocently because the population which came to be known as Rasperoides rohani had been introduced. Rasperoides pallidus is a lowland species found in lowland rainforests but someone for reasons of conservation uh, unknown to anyone else had taken a population of pallidus and introduced it into this stream in Singharaja. And there the, the species has bred and uh, persists to this day and for reasons that we don't quite understand now has changed very slightly morphologically including reaching a larger size um, which is a phenomenon in ecology when a species has uh, fewer predators and fewer competitors uh, it might grow to a larger size and so came to be mistaken for a new species. So let's have a quick look at the ways in which we make mistakes in taxonomic papers, at least some of the ways. The first thing is to make sure that your measurements are not only accurate, as accurate as you can make them, but also that they're repeatable. In many papers you have occasions to see stuff like methods follow Smith et al. 2014. You turn up Smith et al. 2014 and you find that that p paper says my methods follow Jones et al. Uh, 2008. In other places authors say methods follow Smith et al. 2014 and Jones et al. 2008. Which methods follow which author is not made clear. Such a paper, unfortunately, has to be rejected out of hand. There's no point reading any further because the methods aren't repeatable and if the methods are not repeatable, there's no value in the science. So we, we have no choice but to throw it out. Another problem is that often authors claim to take measurements to a certain level of precision, very commonly if you're using uh, uh, calipers, would be to have a precision of 0.1 millimeters. But then in the body of the paper, you see that the level of precision is changing. So you, you start entertaining doubts as to how the measurements were in fact taken. And if, if your methods, again, are not reliable enough for you to give your measurements in a consistent manner, there's no value in your measurements. So you need to remember that smaller measurements, uh, the smaller a measurement becomes if you're using calipers as a as a tool for measurement, uh, measurements below 10 millimeters start having larger and larger errors and measurements above about 30 or 40 centimeters because you're getting into the range where you have to use a rule or a tape again start having a different kinds of error. So when specimen data have inconsistent types of errors incorporated in them they become heteroscedastic. This is a uh, an idea in statistics that's well worth looking up. There's an excellent 
Wikipedia article with common world examples so that you can immediately appreciate how important heteroscedasticity is in uh, taxonomy and learn to avoid or at least appreciate the problems that are associated with it. You also need to bear in mind that specimens are not planar, they don't Though we make measurements in two dimensions, specimens are three-dimensional objects, they grow in a three-dimensional fashion where volume is probably more linear than length. And specimens are flexible. So there will always be errors associated with your measurements of a species. And if you don't appreciate those errors, you might read your, your results in a different way than if you did appreciate the errors. We rarely draw error bars when we consider uh, morphological differences between species. But this is something that definitely needs to be taken into consideration. Nowhere do I see less attention to this problem being paid than in reproducing GPS coordinates. If you look at the top right of the screen, you can see the readout you get on a on the monitor of a typical GPS um, and this often gives your geographic coordinates to a precision of as much as 11 decimal places as here. Now that's absolutely meaningless because if you're anywhere close to the equator as you are perhaps in South India at a latitude of 6 or 8 or 10 degrees um, anything more then perhaps four places of decimals makes very little sense. Uh, four places of decimals would give you a, a precision of about 10 meters. Five places would give you a precision of about plus or minus one meter. And definitely anything less than that is of no use whatsoever. Because it shows that you weren't paying attention to the precision associated with your measurements. Also, though the GPS gives you altitudes to a claimed precision of 0.1 meter, GPS altitudes are no better than about plus or minus 5 meters. So there's, there's a need to appreciate the meaning of the results you're getting. And nowhere is this clearer than if you think for a moment about how GPS data are transformed onto maps. GPS system assumes that the Earth is spherical. So for starters, it isn't. And then it has to transform a spherical system of coordinates, radial coordinates, into a planar map in two dimensions using, for example, a Cartesian projection. To do this, each region is allocated a geodetic data. Now if you don't know the way in which your geodetic datum has been uh, defined and where in that datum you are, your GPS will have different amounts of error and very rarely, I mean in fact I've only seen one paper in which this was mentioned, um, very rarely do authors take this into account. And so just parroting the results you see from a GPS readout shows that you're not paying attention to what your results really mean and that's best avoided. So remember that when you describe a new species and the vast majority of taxonomic papers are describing new species, you need to actually test the hypothesis that the species is new and not just list the differences that you're observing. You need to test the statistical significance of your results and evaluate the significance by examining larger series from wider geographic areas. Five or ten specimens from a single point in one river is a very weak sample. The more samples you can have from a, a greater area, the better your results, the more reliable your results will be. And finally, it's important to try to falsify the null hypothesis, thinking to yourself, perhaps this species isn't new after all. How can I show that it might just be the same as its nearest congener? So remember that 
taxonomy isn't the same as stamp collecting. We're not looking for just two stamps with slight differences, like printing mistakes. Species are variable entities. Evolution is impossible if all members of a species are identical, if they're all clones of each other. There has to be variation within species, and taxonomy should reflect that variation. There can be variation in morphology, in ecology, in behavior, and many other kinds uh, of differences in the phenotype or the extended phenotype of species. And this is something that taxonomic papers need to pay attention to. Especially in the discussions of papers, I see very little attention paid to the wider context of the species. In many cases, discussions focus on ideas that should be explained in the diagnosis. In other words, the difference between the new species and its congeners. When it comes to methods that are flawed, perhaps nowhere better is, is this exemplified than in the different ways in which standard length comes to be measured. This is the fundamental measurement in ichthyology, standard length. And I'd recommend this paper by Jeffrey Howe, which explains the history of standard length and the different ways in which standard length has come to be measured. If you look at the species here on the uh, top left, uh, you can see that the anterior limit of the standard length is taken at the, uh, the extreme uh, front of the lower jaw, and it ends where the lateral line ends. The species at the bottom, the anterior extent is, uh, limit is the same, but the posterior limit ends where the fleshy terminal of the caudal peduncle meets the caudal fin rays. The top right fish um, has the posterior extremity of the standard length being taken, I don't know, somewhere above the, <laughs> above the uh, point where the principal caudal fin rays, uh, the uppermost and lowermost ones, seem to meet the caudal peduncle. It doesn't matter really where you take this measurement. What does matter is that you take it consistently in the same place. Very often I see manuscripts saying standard length taken from tip of snout to the uh, hypural plate. This is perhaps not a very useful way of saying it because if you look at an x-ray of a typical cyprinid, the commonest com family in South Asia, um, the hypural plate is in fact quite a long uh, structure and you need to explain whether you're going to take it to the anterior end of the plate or the posterior end of the hypereal bones. But it, it may not apply to all different fishes. So if, if you're dealing with uh, mistress, for example, in catfishes, the, the base of the hypereal isn't easy to find uh, externally. And so you might use the, the fleshy posterior end of the hypereal bones as your external landmark. Similarly, measuring head length, you need to be clear as to whether you're measuring it to the front of the head or the front of the upper jaw, the tip of the snout. Because there is a difference. If, if a fish has a superior mouth, as in this esomus, you'd find a difference there. Also, the posterior end of the head, typically measured to the posterior margin of the uh, opercle, but you need to say clearly whether you mean the posterior ma margin of the operculum, the bony structure, or the membrane that covers the opercle, which is part of the opercle, of course. So these two landmarks can give you widely different uh, measurements and hence proportional measurements. Especially when multiple authors are contributing measurements, you need to be very careful that everyone understands what they're doing. Also, it's worth paying attention to structures that are important but often overlooked. This lovely paper by William Gosling um, explains the importance of the tiny unbranched dorsal fin rays 
in cyprinids, which often uh, go unnoticed because they're subdermal. But they're of huge taxonomic value and worth paying attention to, the, the tiny bones at the base of the dorsal fin. Another problem in comparative studies is an uncritical parroting of the older literature. Of course, it's much easier to take a comparative data from someone else's published version. But very often, these published versions are using methods that are different from the ones that you're using. So unless you can make sure that that work is reliable to start with and that it uses methods identical to yours, there's no point using those data. I see more and more papers in which authors also just have locality data extracted from catalog of fishes. Now, I have the greatest admiration for the catalogue of fishes. It's probably the most important ichthyological work that was published in the 20th century, certainly one of the most important resources that exist today. But you need to remember that catalogue of fishes is a secondary work. The primary literature it relies on is reflected usually quite accurately there. But you have to go to the primary literature and look, because very often it gives you only what's in that primary literature without without actually reflecting um, details that you might be able to find out from other sources. I'll give you an example in a minute. So remember that measurements in the published literature are not a wholly acceptable alternative to measurements you make yourself from comparative material, especially comparative type material of congeners in the group that you are describing a new species in. In recent years, in the last 10 years, we've seen more and more papers giving us uh, CO1 barcode data uh, on fishes. And there is an emerging trend, a fashion, that CO1 data are being given, or distances are being given, as a diagnostic m measurement. I worry about this because we know that these P distances of CO1 can give us quite misleading results. And so uncritically quoting CO1 data is not wise unless you really have a good body of supporting data to back you up. Here's a recent paper of Hiranya looking at Channa orientalis. Channa orientalis is a species of Channid endemic to Sri Lanka, again restricted to the southwestern rainforest quarter of the island. And Hiranya showed that the CO1 difference between the northern population and the southern population of Channa orientalis is between 7 and 8 percent. In fact, it's more than 7 or 8 percent, 7 and 8 percent. But the specimens, the morphology of the specimens of those two populations is identical. Uh, you can measure dozens of specimens carefully, uh, regardless of how experienced the ichthyologist is and not find any difference. They are a good example of what should be called a cryptic species. But of course, he didn't describe the species because he felt that we needed more data. And finally, even between these two identical, even though the distance between these two identical uh, uh, populations is about 7 or 8 percent, the distance between those two populations and their nearest congener, which is Chandagachua, is much less about 5%. So again, you have a non-intuitive result, outcome, in a, in a group like this. So when it comes to using CO1P distances for uh, chanids, you need to be cautious, um, and also for some other groups. So you can't reproduce these data um, uncritically without giving some context for why you think they are valid. As I told you earlier, very often the lack of discussion of intraspecific variation is a good cause for rejecting a paper. But very, in, in many cases, authors simply don't pay attention to the diversity of morphology within species. They try to reduce species to a single set of metrics. 
um, means, standard deviations, ranges, and so on. But to get an idea of the whole richness of intraspecific variation is something you see rarely in papers from this region. As I mentioned before, very often we see sample sizes less than 10. This doesn't lead to any statistical confidence, especially if they've been selected from a single location, and especially if they're from a size range, a different uh, class of sizes, so that you can expect allometry to pay, uh, play a substantial role. We have osteological differences being described from just clearing and staining one or two specimens. Osteology, like everything else, is variable. It's not cast in stone. And so you need to remember that larger series of cleared and stained specimens are necessary and should be closely examined before making conclusions on osteology, a mistake that I myself have made in the past. So uh, to, to repeat, uh, size matters. Uh, allometry is something that needs to be taken into account because most growth in fishes is allometric. Small fishes have a much larger relative size of eye, for example, much lower body depths, and as you can see from a little platy and an adult platy, um, these differences are quite substantial. So when you, when you do your measurements and you class your species together, you should class them uh, by groups of size and compare like with like. Also worth bearing in mind is that ontogenic changes uh, do occur in fishes with, for example, in silurids, in ompoc, uh, in volago and so on, with anal fin ray counts or any large counts of um, rays. Meristics d do change as the fish uh, grows in size. And so if you're comparing with a, a putative new species with, for example, volago atu, you, you must compare fishes of similar age and size. Very often we are lazy to examine a sufficient body of comparative material uh, because of issues of access. Uh, very few museums in, in southern Asia loan specimens. You have to get permission to go and work there. Permission takes time. I am sympathetic to the problem. But at the same time, the science is not um, sound unless you have examined comparative material with the same care. And similar series to the actual species you are describing. So citing secondary sources for your morphological data, for example, Talwa and Jingren, 1991, I see this commonly cited, very useful book at, at the time. But the point is they didn't examine material themselves for all their species. They extracted a lot of it from the literature and they didn't always cite where they got their data from, their distribution data or their morphological data. So as useful as Talwa and Jingren's uh, Fishes of India was, it is not a replacement for measuring your own specimens. And I've already referred to the problem with, uh, with the limitation with catalogue of fishes. We often see comparative data coming from the wrong localities. Many of the earlier authors didn't specify clearly what their localities were, but with a little detective work, you can work out, you can find where they made their collections and when those collections were made, even in cases where the type specimens themselves are missing, as in the case of uh, Hamilton, Jordan and McClelland in most cases. I saw a manuscript recently describing a species very similar to Opsarius uh, uh, Barna, but <coughs> the authors had considered Barna to be a widespread species and uh, collected a population from a convenient location without paying attention to where exactly in Bengal the type locality of Barna was. Where does the true Opsarius Barna live? Also the problem is in general like Opsarius Barilius and Ryamas, which superficially look similar, you might 
allocate your new species to the wrong genus and compare it only with congeners in that genus and thereby miss the wider diversity. This happens also with loaches quite often. So Hamilton says that he found in his, in his 1822 book, he says that he found Baralius Barna in the Yamuna and Brahmaputra rivers. A true story. But his type, the specimen that he illustrated in his, in his book, came from uh, Gualpara, a very specific location. And this is explained in Ralph Britz's wonderful f book, uh, Francis Hamilton's Gendretic Fishes. If you don't have a copy, this is worth stealing. Because, because it's probably the most important book to be published on South Asian fishes in the last, since, since Francis Day. Hamilton, after all, is the founder, uh, author of South Asian ichthyology. And Ralph has brought new life to Hamilton's work by finding the exact type localities for most of his species and also publishing beautiful color illustrations. Uh, as you know, Hamilton didn't publish the colored version himself. He couldn't afford to get the uh, hand paintings that were then necessary. Color printing hadn't still been invented. And Ralph uh, has mapped the locations from which Hamilton traveled and collected his species. The fishes were all drawn from life, as Hamilton himself said, uh, mostly by his uh, Bengali artist Haluda. Um, and uh, in Hamilton's Gangetic Fishes, Ralph explains the background of all these uh, species, uh, at least all the ones for which he could find the information, and that, that's the majority. Another thing to remember on, in similar vein is that fishes don't respect political borders. This is Orisius Ar Uwai, uh, described by Tyson Roberts from Myanmar, and over the past 10 years, editing for Zoo Taxa, I've had three manuscripts which were rejected, uh, describing Orisius Uwai from Bengal and uh, from Bangladesh. It's, uh, it's worth remembering that when we find a putative new species, we must also look at uh, countries, other countries in the region to see whether the species might exactly uh, might occur there as well. This becomes an even more important problem now that we're seeing more and more alien species being introduced by fisheries and the aquarium hobby into waters all over the region. It's also important before you publish to check that your literature, literature survey is as up-to-date as possible. So here's another mistake I made. Uh, this is a new genus we described in 2012. Uh, we originally named it uh, Dravidia, for the group that includes uh, what used to be Pontius fasciatus, beautiful fishes from the Western Ghats. And um, while I did a literature survey in 2010 that found that the name Dravidia hadn't been used anywhere in zoology, I didn't check again at the time the paper was published two years later, because often a paper has a fairly long gestation. By the time the paper was published, someone else had published the name Dravidia in entomology. And so it wasn't a valid genus, and we published a replacement name for it, Haludaria, after uh, Hora's, uh, sorry, after Hamilton's uh, scientific illustrator from Bengal. Another important reason for which papers are being rejected increasingly is the poor state of type specimens. If your type specimens are badly preserved, especially because nowadays we illustrate all type specimens in, in manuscripts, your reviewers are not, not going to have much confidence in your work. The top left specimen is of course uh, an old Cuvier specimen and that's about as bad as a museum specimen can become. I think because it wasn't uh, preserved properly in the first place. The, the, type of, uh, I think this is Mr. Uh, Coletius. Um, but the other two specimens are collected recently. As you can see in the bottom example, the fins are broken. Um, this is not a specimen that should be in, in a type series 
unless in a very well explained exception. The top right is a mistus. Uh, it had died sometime before preservation. The gut contents have expanded. There's gas in the stomach. The specimen is distorted. The fins are damaged. Not a good specimen to be in a type series, unless in very special circumstances. I suspect you've picked up some things about the uh, code of zoological nomenclature over the past week, but I just want to mention a couple of things uh, that are problematic because this is another reason for which papers fail to get accepted. Um, <clears throat> where you store them. Museum collections are the gold standard if it's a national museum. So for India, for example, I wouldn't question if specimens were preserved, for example, in the Zoological Survey of India or the Bombay Natural History Society. But many authors submit work that involves specimens that are in private collections or in their university collections. University collections are notorious for being uh, ephemeral. They, they might not last the lifetime of the author that founded them. There are large museum uh, university collections, of course, but I doubt about them being available in the long term. So you need to make sure that your specimens have gone into a repository that is consistent with Article 72F, Recommendation 72F of the Code of Zoological Nomenclature. And if I see a manuscript that doesn't conform to this, I usually ask the authors to make sure that their specimens go to a, a proper museum before we will consider the paper. Similarly for sequences, your sequences must be acceptable. By the time you submit your manuscript, your sequences must be uh, on gene bank. They must be available to re reviewers to check and verify because many reviewers will take the trouble to check the alignments, for example. And if you don't share the sequences, they can't do this and they wouldn't process your manuscript. One of the most tragic reasons for papers to fail or species to be uh, invalidated, nominal species to be invalidated, is that the location of the collection of the holotype, the name-bearing type, isn't declared. This is one of those obscure things in the Code of Zoological Nomenclature, Article 16.4.2, says that in addition to giving the name of the institution at which your uh, types are stored, you must also give the location. For example, it's not good enough just saying Bombay Natural History Society. You've got to say Bombay Natural History Society, Mumbai. If you omit the Mumbai, technically, your, your species is not validly named. So it becomes an unavailable name. The code's got many quirks in it. For example, there's no compulsion that types need to be preserved, but if you submit a paper to Zootaxa without types being preserved, there's a good chance that the editor will reject it. But the code doesn't insist on it. And it doesn't even uh, require that types be identified by a registration number. Um, these are things that probably will change in the future. Another loophole is that it doesn't clearly say what a diagnosis is. Recently we had this paper published in Zoo Keys uh, 400 odd species of wasps from Costa Rica, all of them described uh, or diagnosed only by a barcode, as you can see in the bottom left. Uh, this is a, a terrible way to do taxonomy. It's uninformative. There's no way these species can be recognized in the field. Uh, any survey of wasps in Costa Rica in the future necessarily has to sequence all of them and check against the barcode. So. I really don't see the value of this kind of taxonomy, but the authors who publish this are very reputed people. They probably had good reasons for it. It's just that I don't know how to appreciate those reasons yet. Poor quality images, another, another reason, inexcusable in this day of digital cameras being so cheap. You can take excellent pictures even with an iPhone. So if you don't take good photographs of your types, there's a good chance your paper will be uh, rejected even without going for review. Uh, so this is this is a common problem. Um, not following the methods that you yourself have declared. Very often I, I see this. For example, you uh, authors might give a method for counting vertebrae, uh, saying that they count the Weberian apparatus as, as five or as one, and then when you actually look at the counts, they don't cons they are not consistent with that. Uh, methodology. 
they uh, miss or misrepresent uh, important characters. This is something I've done myself. For example, the uh, neuromass on the jaws of uh, cyprinids are sometimes referred to as tubercles, something I've made that mistake myself. But they're, if they're properly neuromass, they should be called that and not be called tubercles, for example, because the methodology demands that. And if your meristics and proportions obviously differ from your photographs, many reviewers check this, um, obviously your paper will be rejected. So you need to make sure that your illustrations are consistent with your descriptions. It's surprising how often authors miss that point. A paper that doesn't discuss the evolutionary context of their species, the biogeography, the, the most closely related species, uh, to the new species and so on, is an uninteresting paper and somehow those papers tend to get rejected more often. An excessive number of authors is another irritant in papers. The maximum number of authors for a single species that I've had to process was 17. An author shouldn't be, for example, the person who issued you a collection permit or who let you into a, a collection locality. If the English in your manuscript is terribly flawed, if it's going to take me more time to copy edit it into shape than it took you to write it, your paper will be rejected. This is a problem. And you might be interested to know the genera from which the most rejections have been made. Uh, each of these genera, uh, Pethia, Gara, Schistera and Glyptothorax, have had species uh, rejected from Zootax at least five times in each case over the past uh, 10 years by me. Um, and in most of those cases, I suspect that the new species were in fact valid. They were just papers that were defective, manuscripts that were defective. So it's, it's important um, to recognize that even papers that are rejected very often are dealing with valid results. It's just that the results haven't been presented in a way that is acceptable in a, a, a good taxonomic publication. So my advice is subject yourself to tough peer review because peer review helps you to improve your own work. Remember your reviewers are usually anonymous and they get no credit for all the hard work they made in, in helping you to improve your paper. You get all the credit. And one important way of avoiding rejection is to get friendly review. Before you submit a paper to the journal, send it out to a colleague and say, can you review this for me? Can you read it and tell me what might be my problems? Fix those problems and then submit it. Your chances of success are much greater. And something I rarely see in South Asia, except in the case of a few exceptions, I mean, notably Ralph Britz, who's been collaborating with uh, the, the, the group of ichthyologists who uh, organized this this, I mean, this uh, workshop now. There's very little uh, collaboration between scientists in the Asian region uh, and scientists, uh, global experts in other parts of the world. This is something that needs to change. You had the opportunity to listen to some of the world's greatest ichthyologists in the course of this workshop. Most of them would welcome uh, collaboration in the context of uh, their groups of interest. And such collaboration is something from which you can learn a huge amount. I myself am not a biologist, I'm an engineer. I came to this because fish were my hobby. And almost everything I've learned about fish has been learned from people I collaborated with, people like Maurice Cotillard, Ralph Britz, who have helped me formally and informally, whether by authorship or not, to improve what I know about fish. Try to avoid getting a manuscript rejected. The first manuscript that I was an, an author of that was rejected happened about three weeks ago. I didn't sleep that night. I was only about the fifth author. My contribution to the paper was almost trivial. But still, it was the first time a manuscript with which I was associated was rejected, and it really upset me. So I know that rejection hurts. Reviewers spend a lot of time helping you to improve your work and you can learn a huge amount from peer review. It's free, don't lose that opportunity. And finally, this is my dictum in publishing, Litera Scripta Manet, a beautiful Latin 
uh, inscription, which basically means that the written word endures. Remember that the taxonomic literature is already almost five centuries old. Work that you publish in taxonomy now will be read and appreciated and criticized centuries from now. Publish in haste, repent at leisure. That should be your motto. I want to thank once again Hiranya Sudhasinghe for contributing to, the, to this presentation uh, with, by producing uh, illustrations for me, uh, for uh, giving me access to his papers and his beautiful photographs. Um, thank you again and good afternoon.